Welcome to the Equal Opportunities Committee. It's the 15th meeting of 2014. Can I ask everyone to set any electronic devices to flight mode or off position, please? Today's only agenda item is an evidence session on having and keeping a home inquiry. And we'll start the session with some introductions. At the table, we have our clerking and research team, our official reporters and broadcasting services. And around the room, we're supported by security officers. And I'd like to welcome everyone in the public gallery as well. My name's Margaret McCulloch, and I'm the convener of the committee. And I'll now invite members and witnesses to introduce themselves in turn, starting on my right. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Marco Biaggi. I'm the MSP for Edinburgh Central, and I'm deputy convener of the committee. Matt and Barr. Good morning. John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. Good morning. Christian Arad, MSP for North East of Scotland. Alec Johnston, <laughs> member for North East Scotland. Siobhan McMahon, uh, Central Scotland, MSP. Uh, John Mason, MSP for Glasgow Shettleston. Alice Ashworth from Crisis. Uh, good morning. Bob Stewart from Dunedin Canberra Housing Association. Good morning. Vicky Phillips from Edinburgh Cyrenians. Hi, I'm Nick Harleybell from Homeless Action Scotland. Hi, uh, Roseanne Cubitt from Relationship Scotland. Emma Dorr, Shelter Scotland. Thank you, everyone. Um, first question I'm going to ask is about the Children and Young People's Act. And could I ask witnesses if you could indicate if you would like to answer the questions when we're in the session, we can add you to our list. Um, the witnesses that we, we spoke to on the 14th of August spoke positively about the Act, but highlighted the importance of effective implementation. Um, can I ask witnesses what your views are on the Act and ask you to talk specifically about any areas of concern that you may have and how these areas should actually be approached? So who would like to start first? Will I pick someone? <laughs> Bob, since you're the only male in the group, can I ask you first of all, picking you? Uh, th thanks for pointing it out, Chair. <laughs> um, I suppose from my point of view, and, and as I say this as a, as a social worker in my background, is that I really welcome the, the Act and I think that it gives opportunities for all organisations involved with working with young people, whether they be in people who have come from the care background or, or not. I think there's great opportunity there, what I think for the multi-agency working, and I think that's one of the important bits um, of the Act. And I particularly welcome um, that the Act is now looking to assist people uh, up to the age of 25, I think my experience over the years um, is that often young people um, leave care, come into the community and struggle. Um, and in my particular area of homelessness, we see that quite a lot. And so I welcome the fact that uh, it's now extended up to 25. I think there may be some issues there in terms of the funding of those services and the funding of those support issues. And I think that's something that the committee may want to look at in relation to what through COSLA with the, the, the councils is that what we're experiencing on the ground is that whilst there's a, a huge commitment from councils to work with young people, particularly with those with care backgrounds, um, there's still the issue of resources. There's still the issues of, in my case, of uh, facilities that can help young people in relation to, first of all, um, uh, dealing with very strong personal issues, which may be to do with drugs and alcohol and other things. But equally, um, the fundamental issue of setting up and keeping a home, and in relation to that, I think that perhaps as the morning wears on, that uh, we can have some discussions around uh, the kind of examples of how that's been addressed by organisations like ourselves and others around the table. Um, but the, the important thing for me is that, that it's now been recognised that young people who have care backgrounds have particular issues, and those issues extend beyond the point when they've left the care of the, of the, the local authority. Thank you. Um, anybody else like to comment? Yes, Nick. Um, again, kind of echoing, um, Bob, that we um, welcome particularly the sort of like definition of corporate parenting. I mean, in a very sort of 1066 and all that way, it is a good thing. Um, but it needs to have a real practical meaning, and I'm not sure that that has been worked on enough to make sure it translates across as uh, something so that everyone who is a corporate parent has an equal understanding of what their responsibilities are as a corporate parent. Um, a young person 
that I was talking to described sort of like the continuing care aspect as being a long conversation rather than a brief argument. And I thought that was a good way of, of thinking about things in that it is about making sure that there are smooth transitions and that it isn't just that someone slams a door. Um, but having that conversation um, also requires that young people are empowered to know that this is their right. And unless there is a statutory duty supporting, um, uh, telling young people of support that a public body has to um, promote and deliver well-being rights outcomes, then there's a disconnect. There's an opportunity for what is a broadly welcomed and a positive piece of legislation to actually not deliver as well as it could. And I think that sort of element of beefing up the rights element, making sure that someone has got the checks and balances in place to ensure that all young care experienced people know what their rights are. Can I ask, I mean, Vicky, you were nodding your head when Bob was speaking as well, and we're talking about actual resources. I mean, how is your organisation actually going to be able to cope with the extra workload when you take on people over the age of 18 to 25? How will you cope? Because I'm assuming you're probably quite stretched just now. So how will you actually manage that extra workload? I think it would be very much around ensuring that joint working is, is happening across all partner organisations, including the authorities and, and all the all of our partners around the table and, and other um, services. I don't think Cyrenians would ever claim to have the answer to all of a young person's um, situations and problems and issues. And that um, it would be very much about, I think, conversations, the conversation rather than the short argument um, with the young person regarding what it is that they would be looking for and who is actually best placed to, to be providing those services. Um, I would be particularly keen to be having very clear conversations with local authority frontline staff about their understanding of, of their duties um, because certainly my experience would be um, through working with young people that often you can have very different information coming from from one department or even within one department. You, you can talk to one person and they, they're very clear about what, what needs to happen and how that should happen. And another person in the same department who has a completely different understanding of actually what somebody might be entitled to. Um, and so I think, again, that very clear information that everybody has at the same time is, is critical for, for young people, whether from a care background or not. Thanks very much. We heard on the 14th of August very moving stories from young people um, about their experience of homelessness. But could you give us sort of specific issues that you've actually came across um, faced by care leavers? So will I have to pick somebody else again randomly? OK, Emma, <laughs> would you like to comment? Sure. Uh, Shelter works broadly with uh, homeless people across Scotland. We help around half a million people every year. And um, amongst those would be care leavers, but there aren't any specific projects which focus on care leavers. Um, However, we've seen through di different projects you know, that the transitioning from care into uh, independent living, uh, as the committee has heard previously, can be very difficult indeed. They, um, the engagement with professionals, uh, which has happened th throughout their life, can in, in some cases result in almost like a, a, an engagement fatigue for care leavers um, by the time they reach young adulthood. Um, but at the same time, they can be more uh, experienced in dealing with professionals in their lives. Yeah. Rosanne, would you like to comment on your experience? Yeah, no, just adding, adding to that, I think um, very clearly the skills that they, uh, they talked about when they were, were here, I think we, we see that in things that we would maybe take for granted actually is, is a real challenge for them. So that's some of the work that, that we can do in, in terms of helping in communication, conflict resolution. Some of, I think, the things that we would just say 
doesn't everybody know how to do that actually is something that that they can learn and and develop and and take ownership and responsibility for their own decision making because I think they've been in a situation where they've um decisions have been made for them and it's about kind of empowering them to make those decisions themselves so I think that's our kind of experience one of the the areas that we come across as a housing association um, who, who are housing uh, people of all ages, but in particular looking at young people, is the lack of preparedness for young people from the care background for independent living, for living in the community. Um, and I think that's an area that people are working on it now. Uh, let's be clear on that when it is happening. But um, from our point of view as a housing association, and, and, and other housing associations. Tenancy failure um, is an issue uh, per se, uh, but tenancy failure for young people um, is, is more prevalent, uh, basically because of their lack of knowledge and skills and experience in that area. For most young people leaving care, coming into the community, it'll be a first time. It'll be a first time tenancy. And uh, therefore that's an area we've been looking at in, in uh, my submission on behalf of Doreen Kammer and Foursquare, our partner organisation, made reference to um, young people's tenancy training flat scheme and the success of that. And the success of that has been built upon the fact that we have a housing provider such as Doreen Kammer and a support provider from Foursquare and the associated organisation that goes with it. As colleagues have been mentioning already, the importance of joint work cannot be stressed the importance of, of, of everyone coming together and being prepared to come out of the silos um, to work with young people per se is, is something we need to be looking at. And what we have shown is that if, if we blend those experiences together from the different organisations, that you can, in fact, achieve a quite remarkable success. I mean, in my paper I sent to you, I made mention that you know, nearly half of the young people who have come into this tenancy training scheme we work in partnership with Foursquare with, have care backgrounds. And by focusing on the range of issues that they come with, whether it's personal issues or family nature, family breakdown, whether it's to do with issues around their health, including drugs and alcohol, or whether it's to do with the very basic issues of having, keeping a home, or being able to go into a home and, and manage it, um, is something we focus on, and by, by focusing on those and helping them to develop those skills and include within that raising the bar in terms of helping people to go back to school, helping young people to go into further education, to take up employment opportunities and training. Um, by putting all that together into a package, we have found that, that we have great success with young people, and particularly young people with care backgrounds, there are issues around that, going back to what are the issues for care leavers, which affect all young people. And one of those issues is the difficulty with the, the benefit systems we have and the welfare system we have, where if, for young people to take up a, a, an opportunity in a college course is very, very difficult because it affects their housing benefit. And often we have the sad situation of young people saying, I can't do it because I just cannot afford to take up this course. I can't afford to continue this positive pathway into education and employment. And I have to say, uh, uh, colleagues around them, we're looking with interest as to whether or not, after the referendum, whether matters such as housing benefit come to Scottish Parliament. We'll be very much looking at that and willing to participate in the debate and discussion and how, if that occurs, how we can make life better and stop these barriers being set up for young people moving into education and into uh, go back to school. So. Um, thank you very much for that. I'm very aware that we've just been joined in the public gallery by a high school. Um, so I'm delighted to see you all here. And could I ask the witnesses then, when we're actually speaking, um, not to assume even ourselves included, that... <coughs> The terminology you, you're going to be using, if you could explain in detail for the benefit of everybody, um, we'd really appreciate that. Thank you. And can I now pass you on to Alex Johnson? Thank you. 
I'll, I'll take your warning and try and keep the terms <laughs> simple. The, the, we've been discussing on this committee and on other committees uh, issues surrounding the House and Options approach to homelessness. Uh, and I have to say that some of my experience uh, with witnesses uh, uh, has been very positive uh, and others have been less positive about the housing options approach. So I wondered if you could tell us uh, what your experience is so far uh, and how you think uh, it is working. Emma. Thank you for the question. Um, we welcome the housing options approach uh, and think that any uh, approach which is encouraging a prevention and early intervention uh, approach to homelessness is positive and the, um, the intention of housing options is to give individuals more of a choice uh, and that, that can only be a good thing as far as we're concerned and yet uh, there's such a variety of implementation of the housing options approach across Scotland. Uh, Shelter Scotland welcome the recent activity of the homelessness team in uh, responding to the Scottish housing regulators recommendation around the development of guidance. They've pulled together a small working group involving uh, lead local authorities um, and, and that's great because we do feel that the, there needs to be some guidance around how you implement the housing options or approach, giving di looking at different choices for individuals when they're in a housing needs situation uh, rather than just assuming the homeless route. But th there seems to have been, and certainly the experience of our advisors has been, that there's been some confusion on the front line around the application of that alongside the legislative duty uh, to give a housing assessment when somebody is homeless um, but we would um, we would really call for shelter and other organizations represented here who are um, representing the people who uh, are affected by the housing options process to have an opportunity to input on that guidance rather than just from the local authority side so uh, the and service use as well as well so that the voices of those who are experiencing the housing options process uh, are included in that guidance. Um, we would like the guidance to represent the specialist needs of young people. I mean, the, the focus of this committee is in young people, and I think you know, colleagues around the table would agree that young people uh, experience the, the journey of homelessness in a unique way. Um, most young people, as has been mentioned before, don't necessarily know or understand their rights uh, or that there's even this thing called housing options. Um, and certainly some of the young people our staff have worked with uh, are very unclear as to what has happened to them when they've gone to the council, uh, whether they've had a housing options interview or whether they have um, made a homeless application. Um, still, some people are not really being given that options-based approach. One of the young people our service has worked with uh, recently was just ha handed a list of bed and breakfasts in the air and to told to get on with it. And for, for a young person, that is overwhelming and inaccessible and not really preventing homelessness at all. It's merely de delaying the problem. I think in terms of young people accessing the housing options approach across the country where there are specialist staff members who understand working with young people who are accessible will talk to them in a way that young people understand that can be very helpful indeed. The experience of approaching the council even if a young person knows that it is accessible to them uh, even if they get there, the experience of going up to a desk where there's an adult in a suit who maybe uses words they don't understand and gives them a form that they potentially can't read it can be very threatening indeed. We've certainly experienced that when a member of our staff goes along with them and can advocate for them, ex uh, explain what's going on in an empowering manner, always supporting the young person to present their views, there can be very positive results for the young person. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to highlight the level of mental health difficulties that young homeless people experience. Um, up to 80% of the young people who use our safe and sound service have mental health issues which make using the housing options uh, 
system trying to navigate that sometimes complex system very, very difficult and things like anxiety depression anger can, can really get in the way so we would um we would really look for any guidance on housing options that's issued to uh to take account of the particular struggles that young homeless people face um vicky would like to come in could you also f um explain what housing options actually is as well, please. Thank you. <laughs> no problem at all, Margaret. Thank you for that opportunity. Um, my understanding of, of housing options and, and what that means as a um, an approach from local authorities um, and national guidance to local authorities is arose out of really the, the uh, commitment to preventing homelessness from happening in the first place. And therefore... Um, asking and if not requiring local authorities to take an approach to when a person, whoever that is, comes to the local authority seeking housing because their housing, their current housing situation is, for whatever reason, um, problematic, that the local authority would, rather than, for example, putting them on a waiting list and saying, well, you just need to be here and wait and you we will give you a house at such time when one comes along um and that that was clearly no longer realistic and hadn't been for a long time in many local authorities um there would be a conversation and that that conversation would include a variety of options of what that could look what their housing situation looks like at the moment and what it could look like um and those would include that would include that conversation would include giving a lot of information on, for example, the private rented sector. In in some areas that that would be so. I suppose one of the dilemmas I think, and I'm I'm kind of going off. Perhaps I'm going off a bit because actually explaining housing options in one short sentence it isn't really all that straightforward, um, and it's very uh, specific to the local authority itself. I think, and and that's one of the real challenges. And I think when I was um, nodding my head when Emma was talking, it was really about this. Um, Absolutely, we would all welcome the idea that people have choice um, when it comes to where they live. Um, however, that's you have a real dilemma, I think, in terms of balancing um, the the local area and and what what's actually available in terms of choice, along with having a national nationally consistent policy that is that is delivered in pretty much exactly the same way, whatever part of the country you're in. And I think that that's possibly one of the real I don't have the answer to, to that dilemma but I think it's important that we recognize that that is something that's that's across the board in terms of housing options thank, thank you um Alex Alice would like to come in but I don't know if you want to go first and finish your questions and um, then Alice can come in the back of it the I think we've, we've covered uh, many of the questions I was going to ask, but the one thing I, I'd be interested in hearing slightly more about is uh, housing options where it applies to care leavers specifically and any issues that are surrounding that. Alice, do you want to answer that? Yeah. So um, the, the, the point that I wanted to come in on was... Um, about the potential of housing options to identify opportunities for housing in the private rented sector. And earlier this summer, we conducted research where we held interviews with local authority staff in seven case study areas across Scotland. Um, and uh, this particular project was looking at the, um, uh, the, about helping young people into shared accommodation in the private rented sector because of the extension of the shared accommodation rate, which I'm sure we'll come on to later. What we found in that research was that there was a real lack of understanding amongst housing advisors across these local authorities of what was available locally in the private rented sector, um, including shared, shared options, you know, options in, in shared accommodation. Um, and while there are some examples of good practice um, where there are schemes to support young people into to this sort of housing. We identified here a real need to, um, to 
empower and, and provide the necessary support for local authority staff so that they really um, are increasing their knowledge of the sector and are sufficiently able to support young people into it where it is, uh, where it is an option, particularly for those who are limited to, to the shared accommodation rate. Um, in, in that respect, um, I can't really answer your question about care leavers, um, primarily because when it comes to the shared accommodation rate, which is our particular interest in this area, um, fortunately, care leavers do have uh, do have an exemption up to the age of 22 from the shared accommodation rate. That said, there is obviously an issue about young people being able to um, to take advantage of those exemptions, because we know certainly from other exemptions, so the exemption for those who have lived in a homeless hostel, for instance, we um, conducted research that found that one in five housing advisors said that none of their clients had been able to uh, take advantage of those exemptions where they were, in, where they were entitled to them. Um, so I think that is, that is still uh, an ongoing issue. Um, but as I say, the, um, uh, in terms of the, the housing options approach, um, our main concern really at, at the moment is that, um, that it is not sufficiently identifying options within the private rented sector, which for some young people could actually be, um, be a viable option for them to sustain a tenancy. Alex, um, you okay with that, Alex? Yeah, um, I think. I wonder if anybody else had anything to say about care leavers. Nick, a little bit. Um, th through our work uh, alongside the Scottish Through Care and Aftercare Forum, um, we've had some sort of joint practice meetings, um, trying to share housing practice with through care practice, um, which of course is all going to become continuing care practice, which is another issue that we might get onto. Um, we found that from the housing side of things, there is an understanding of what housing options means. And that it is, it's that process that Vicky managed to define of looking at, you did brilliantly compared to what I'd have come up with, um, of looking at a range of options that suit the local area that are available at that time that might prevent someone from needing to make a homeless application. Young people with uh, care experience background, um, it's within the care leavers' guidance that they shouldn't be put through a homeless route. And so the housing options for them, it's almost as though it runs in parallel to the homeless route. And it, we were discovering that from talking with through care workers, um, it's as though you have the same process, but again, without the same rights. And so they were finding that the friends of the people that they were working with, who, same age, similar issues, um, would be housed quicker through taking the homeless application than the young people who were going through the care leaving process. Now, whether they were housed more appropriately is different. Um, one of the great... Um, there's, there's some great practice that's happening across Scotland. One of them, Edinburgh's... Um, Care Leavers Housing Options Panel, where I think it's, the, again, it is about conversation, and it's about the art of gentle persuasion, that just because you have a right to a flat doesn't mean that you should actually take that right up, not straight away. Um, and finding the appropriate support solutions to put in place at the right time, so that it's never going to be smooth, it's never going to be without problems, but that there is always someone somewhere who can support you. And we found that the housing people understood housing, the through care people un understood through care, but through care and housing do not speak the same language. And so it, it was as simple as talking about... Um, we were talking about Section 5 referrals, which is where... Bob would know more about it than me, but where a housing association or a social landlord... Um, has, has an obligation to take on a homeless tenant. Through care didn't understand what a Section 5 referral was. Housing saying, why aren't you using so, a Section 5 referrals? And so, well, we don't know what they are. And so if you've got a simple... I mean, we're trying to break that down as, as agencies with the Scottish Through Care and Aftercare Forum and ourselves so that you know, there is a training element here so that, you know, le learn to speak through care or uh, learn to speak housing is, is something that you can do. But when it's as simple as that, you can see how that would then affect young people who know even less than the professionals. 
because they haven't encountered this before. It hasn't been their day-to-day -day job for a number of years. Um, it's not to place blame on anyone. It's just it's two separate cultures that are now having to work more closely together. Um, and there hasn't necessarily been the resource put in to support those two cultures coming together. Thank you very much. We're actually running short of time. We've got quite a lot of questions we would like to ask you. Because can I ask you to keep your questions answers quite short, please, so we can cover everything? Because it's really important we do. Um, Marco would like to come in for a supplementary. Yes, I just had a supplementary to, to Alice based on what you had said in response there. We don't generally do name and shame in the committee, but I do believe in name and praise. You said there were some good uh, examples of, of good practice where there was knowledge of the private rented sector. Can you point us in their direction? Um, certainly, one um, one example of good practice um, we found was in Fife. Um, it's uh, the scheme is called the Fife Key Fund, and they have a ten bed unit which young people can stay in for up to twelve weeks. And in that twelve week period, they're encouraged to essentially buddy up with somebody else um, uh, living in that in that unit. And so, at the end of that twelve weeks, they're then supported by the local authority to. Um, then secure a two-bed tenancy in the private rented sector together. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's been an example of, of good practice that we've seen. Thank you. Um, moving on now to John Mason, please. Hey, thank you, convener. Um, I mean, the area I wanted to look at was uh, mediation, and uh, if I'm correct, Relationship Scotland is one of the, and I think Serenians as well, quite involved in that. Uh, I mean, maybe you could also give us a definition of mediation, as you understand it, and then maybe tell us some of the benefits. Roseanne, yeah, happy to speak on that. Um, so yeah, we've got a network of mediation services across Scotland, 90 mediators. Um, mediation, for the, those of you who don't know, is um, an opportunity for people to get together with a, an independent person, an impartial third person, to basically help that uh, communication um, go smoothly. Um, so one of the, the important things is about um, helping people in the room to listen and hear what the other person's saying. Um, so in the context of this work, uh, one of the, uh, all the research shows that relationship breakdown is a, a key factor in risk of homelessness. Um, so what we can offer is um, an opportunity for young people to meet with their family members, whoever it is that they're in dispute with and create an opportunity for them to have a conversation and talk about the issues, uh, reach an understanding, um, one party to the other, um, to, to find out what's the, the root cause of, of the issue. And in a lot of cases, that allows the young person either to stay at home in a, a more positive environment or to move out and to have their own tenancy, but to have the family support able to, to make that tenancy um, go forward positively. So one of the, the projects that we've done recently is, is with Shelters, the Safe and Sound project in Dundee, because we recognise that our specialist knowledge is around conflict resolution and communication and that area and family and family development, family issues. Um, but the specialist housing um, knowledge, we, if, when we work in partnership with Shelter, allows us to bring that part in as well so that the young people have the opportunity to, to access that um, knowledge with the support of the services working together. So I think when somebody said earlier about partnership working, that's a real good example of, of the two organisations bringing their skill set together to provide a more kind of holistic support. In your paper, I mean, you gave an example of that. Another example you gave was our guy in Butte. Yeah. 75 cases referred, 58% uh, of cases engaged. Well, that sounds reasonable. That's more than half. And 37% resolved their immediate housing problem. But I suppose it does beg the question as to why did they not all want to get involved in mediation? Um, so some of it's about engaging with the process and we're learning as we're going along about how to engage with young people, which is different maybe from our traditional client group. So we're looking at um, engaging through texts and um, SMS messages and um, Facebook uh, private messaging. So some of it's about developing that um, engagement and trust and building up trust. Um, the issues aren't easy to resolve. Mediation isn't a panacea. It's not like a, a magic wand. So it can, um, it can really help. And it can help in the sense of even just understanding about communication and problem solving and developing skills about communication. 
um, or one party is willing to engage yeah. like the young person but yeah, maybe but the rest the, of the family aren't not the family or the other way around yes, yeah. uh -huh. so yes. in that sense we wouldn't count it as mediation because we haven't got them all together but we can still do useful work with mm. one party or the other the other thing we do a lot more with uh, young people uh, and families mediation is we might do a lot more one-to-one -one work with the young person before they ever get to mediation um, so we're kind of um, much more flexible about our model and much more able to respond to, to those needs so the statistics doesn't always give you a kind of clear picture of what's an idea thanks on. Ms Phillips your paper you're involved in this as well is that right and your paper you, you mentioned one local authority I think it's not named where you know you were they seemed up for it they were expecting 20 uh, kind of cases and you ended up with only three in the in the first couple of months or something like that. What was the problems roughly in there? Well, at the risk of showing disrespect, which is not what I mean, to the, um, the people who were responsible for explaining mediation to the young people who were presenting to the lo local authorities homeless, um, I, we were not given the opportunity that we had hoped for to do some training of the, the homeless prevention staff so that they were then put in a position, the homeless prevention staff who were responsible for making the referrals, were actually put in a position of um, having to do all of the housing options assessment interview, all of the kind of questions and, and information gathering that that process requires. And then having to remember that they also needed to say, Oh, and would you like some mediation at the end, it would appear, of, the, of these conversations? Um, and our sense really was, and from the conversation with the, the manager of that service, was that in actual fact, um, people really just either were just not interested. And I think it's one of those things of, um, would you like mediation? And it's a closed question. 99% of the time, people are going to say no. If you say would you like an opportunity to have a bit of a chat with somebody about how things are at home at the moment? The chances are you're going to have a much more positive response to that because you're not putting people in that p position of having to say yes or no to something that they don't actually even know what it is they're really being offered in the first place. Um, do, does that answer your question no. there? Yeah. So, I mean, in that case, uh, in a sense, the money and the personnel were available, but it wasn't all taken up. I also get the impression from some of the papers that it's kind of patchy across the country that in some cases the money and the, the finances aren't there to, to do it. Is, is mediation, I mean, I don't know who can answer this, is mediation an expensive process? Or? If, I would say absolutely not. And in terms of what it can actually achieve in terms of in the preventative spend, it, it's an extremely cheap option, probably almost <laughs> to the point of ludicrously cheap, actually, if you stack it up against what you're potentially saving. Um we have in East Lothian, um, taking the, the name and praise <laughs> approach, um, in East Lothian, our, our Ask to Leave service there has, um, has been incredibly successful, I think, in terms of actually returning people back home uh, where that's an appropriate and safe thing to happen. And that's largely from B&B &B circumstances. And that it is really just, I think, uh, echoing Rosan, it's about being very flexible about actually what do you mean by mediation there anyway. Um, sometimes it is just a bit of a conversation with a, with the parties without actually having to get all kind of formal and round the table and signed up agreements, but, but just a bit of a kind of chat about what's actually going on and providing some support and signposting where that's that's assessed as being required. Right, Mr Stewart, I mean, is that something that you maybe don't call mediation, but you actually do along the way? I think we missed a couple of times about the use of language. Yes. Uh, and and uh, yeah, the mediation as uh, such will take place, but it'll be, it'll be a different language used. And I think that, 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 that Nick Vicky's connect is important for the young people that we careful we don't use the language of the professional and adults. That we use language um, that, that they understand and are comfortable with, and comfortable in a way that then they're prepared to then open up and discuss. At time quite difficult. Uh, Discussion need to take place uh, within families, um, and, and, and that's a skill that, that staff need to have. And it's an area that perhaps is underinvested in, and it's something we should be looking at. Who, sh who should be taking a lead? Oh, well, Miss Doors, coming in now, you, so I can ask you. I mean, who should be taking a lead in encouraging mediation? A, is it the councils? Is it Parliament? Is it the housing associations? Or who is it? Or maybe you want to say something else as well? I, I 
I'd say it's probably all of the above, as Vicky's example shows, where there's not a shared understanding and buy-in to the effectiveness of mediation by frontline staff, uh, then it, it's less effective. If you don't really understand what mediation is and what it can achieve, then you're not really going to be selling it uh, in, in the right way. Um, I think that, uh, as Dunedin Canmore's uh, experience shows, you know, so sometimes it's the you know, the, the right person in the right place. And if the young person has a good relationship with the housing officer or, you know, somebody who, who's popped around, that's great. But um, I, I think it, it's important to say, to, to pick up on the point that's already been made, that it's a lot to do with the mediator being a, a trusted person, somebody that a young person in the family will engage with uh, and, and can feel open to touch on some very difficult, very personal, very gritty issues in, in a safe way uh, and kind of bring that into the open, which is a very v vulnerable thing to do. Uh, and research has shown, and certainly the, the experience of Relationship Scotland and Cyrenian is that uh, that being delivered by an independent person who is not from the housing team at the council uh, is very effective. Uh, somebody for, from our service said, you know, that the fact that they're, they're not wearing a council badge uh, meant that I wanted to talk to them. Um, but also both Safe and Sound Service and Sirenians have found that having the support for a young person and you know, Safe and Sound piloted, having the opportunity to support the family is also important. Um, it's due, through mediation, you can bring up some very difficult issues. It might not just be that there's conflict, but there's conflict because of mental health issues, uh, criminal justice issues, etc. Uh, and just having a conversation can go some way to addressing those, but both parties can need a bit of help to then progress with those issues. We would like. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can, I just... can, can we move on? Sorry, yeah. I'm really short for okay. time. Um, and again, can I just ask you to keep your answers quite short, please, if possible? Um, can I move on to Christian now, please? Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to ask a question about education. I know that uh, some of you in your um, uh, evidence given uh, talked about uh, some program that you were involved in to try to increase uh, the the. The, the prevention at, at early stage at school and making sure that people know, young people know uh, what the, uh, the roots are. At the same time, maybe talking about stereotyping, you know, addressing the stereotyping of homelessness. So I would like to know what kind of program you have, and you talked about some of them, and uh, what kind of influence can you have on the education department? Some of you talked about a lack of enthusiasm from education department. So how can we inspire education departments to put that in the curriculum maybe. Nick. I'm actually when it comes to engaging with education I'm, I'm not even sure if it's encouraging and nurturing that we need to be talking about but actually it's a big stick um, and, and that's unusual for me because I'm more encouraging <laughs> and nurturing. Um, as an organisation, before we were Homeless Action Scotland, we were Scottish Council for Single Homeless, and, and we um, pioneered leaving home and housing education in schools through the development of something called the I'm Offski Pack. I actually had a phone call earlier this week um, from a teacher in a local authority area that I shall not name, who was asking me, "Oh, do you have um, do you have that video on DVD?" They're still using materials from 15 years ago. Um, the situation has changed so much, but it, it was, you know, one, in, one teacher wanted to make sure that her students had some information. She didn't have anywhere else to go, and I, I think she found us more by chance than, than anything else. I, we might have a redirect on our phone number, so that might have helped. Um, the big stick is needed to make sure that the one enthusiastic teacher in every three schools is actually the competent, trained... Um, aware teacher in every school and ideally every teacher in every school um, I would like to see um, that there's no reason for teachers to be experts in housing I, I, I mean I, I, people sitting around the we chose this as a career um, often falling into it rather than choosing it but 
it, it's something that we've actively engaged in. Um, there's no reason why teachers who are brilliant at teaching should choose to know about housing in particular, and yet housing is one of the fundamentals that affects um, young people's attainment. When you look at the you know, shelter have produced brilliant reports about the effects of homelessness on children, if you look at the educational attainment of young homeless people, they are, as, as Bob was saying, that you know they're stifled, they are they are hampered. Um, so I would like to see, and and it is it's a big stick. I would like to see an element of initial teacher education um, to be about factors that can affect young people's learning and looking at housing and housing situations because it's such a fundamental. I mean, it's, everybody has to live somewhere and everybody has to go to school. Um, not everyone who goes to school will have a permanent somewhere to live. Um, I would also like to see um, continuing professional development for teachers accredited in leaving home and housing issues and homelessness issues. And at the moment, it's not there. So how are these... There's nothing to say that the teachers aren't enthusiastic, that the schools aren't enthusiastic, and we provide materials that teachers can use, and we will go wherever we are needed to ensure that there is support there, but we can't be everywhere, it's just me. Um, that's an issue. Uh, to be able to have a CPD course that works, that works for everyone, that works in the same way, that is reflective of real need, and that teachers can feel empowered to actually do the right kind of signposting. And, and it's not enough to rely on um, a local service to come in, because not everywhere has them. And even if you do, not every, um, and I, I will be quick, but, but not every um, third force organisation has the capacity to go out into schools and to deliver it. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Thank you. Christian. Thank you, and particularly, you know, it leads me to another question. You're talking about astonished to see that people are asking for videos and, and, and now DVDs. But, you know, in one of the, uh, in our inquiry, Charlene Makela from uh, UK Scotland, did tell us about uh, why, and asked the question, why there were nothing done on social media. Uh, I think she said it was totally there up. Uh, there are the places that it needs to be hit. So how can we, you know, you talk about a, a, a pack. How, how can we have this pack a lot more available, not only to the teachers, but to the, to the children as well? Uh, and social media will maybe be... Well, I think social media, I mean, it, you can't force a social media thing to happen. If you do, you tend to get it horribly wrong and it falls on its face. Um, and so... Again, it's about ensuring that people have the right information at the right time. And so it, it doesn't become the specialist information. It's just something that people can share. Um, getting the right communication channels. If, if you try to keep up with young people, then you know, as soon as you've got Twitter down pat, they have discovered something else. And I'm sorry, but we're Snapchatting today. Um, we're all moving from Facebook to Ello. We don't know what the next pattern is going to be. And so you have to make sure that the most common communication channels are the ones that are open. So I would rather, rather than follow what could be a passing trend, although I, I believe that things like Facebook and Twitter are here for a wee while yet. I'll, I'll put my hands up to that. Um, that we have to focus on the most common channels of information and where we get our information from that requires a little bit of, of information gathering not heavy research and to you know to put things into that but I do know that people teachers use the website that we provide and have provided and the reason that that is through old-fashioned mail and email that we let them know about it okay that, thank you okay yeah Funding. I know that uh, we talked a lot about uh, uh, action and, and, and funding, and then in the Canmore, and maybe uh, Bob will want to talk about it. Uh, you described funding for youth homelessness as a movable feast. Uh, I, I don't know how the effect of funding cuts 
uh, will uh, will uh, will affect you. And I know you talked about some maybe um, imaginative way of 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 a type of funding. And I will maybe you could share this with the committee. Uh, yes, thanks very much. Uh, uh, two things there. One is uh, creative uh, use of funds is probably more to do with desperation and the fact that we're, not, we're unable to get funds from other sources uh, forces us to, to look at creativity in that area. Uh, this afternoon I'm going to a briefing session in the city chambers uh, where the homeless uh, services and other services will be told there's going to be a, a further 10% cut um, to the funding of, of services. Um, three months after we were told we're going to be a 15% cut. Uh, we're now looking at nearly a 25% cut to funding from the local authority for homeless services in Edinburgh. That's the backcloth. That's the funding backcloth that we're operating to, uh, uh, convener. Um, which means then that, that for, for many organisations, there's some hard decisions that may have to be taken regarding some services, which I think would be very sad if that's the case. But councils themselves have their own funding issues to deal with, and we respect that. We do respect that. My comment on that would be, for young people, the, the importance of investment, the importance of an investment in funding for services to help young people at a stage where we stop the cycle of homelessness, where we stop the cycle of deprivation that takes place. We're very familiar with all of that. I think it's really important that, that we do not go down the track of, of ceasing funding for services that at the moment you know, help to prevent the cycle continuing. In terms of the kind of funding that's going on, we, we, we are all, as people involved in the third sector, involved constantly in finding money to continue the services you're doing just now, but importantly looking to develop other services. And for me, it's important that we do that jointly. And the Dunedin Canmore Housing Association, we have experience of a number of very positive partnerships with agencies that enables us to combine the resources to enable us to deliver those services. At times, it's a bit of a struggle with local councils, with local council departments, God bless them, um, work in silos. And uh, it, it's important that we can encourage our colleagues in the councils to be able to look at multi-departmental funding, as well as multi-agency funding with the health, for instance. And I'd be interested to see um, how the body, Public Bodies Act uh, goes forward in terms of the integration of health and social care. I would like to see that taking place and act as a model for a range of services um, that we, we are all involved in delivering. Thank you. Um, can we move on to Marco now, please? Yeah, uh, to complement the housing options approach, there's been the housing support duty now um, legally since uh, last year. What effect do you think it's had in and of itself? Fire away. I'll make this as quick as possible. I've got about four points. Um, we've recently completed a survey, a very sort of quick and dirty survey of, of local authorities, of which we had about 19, 20 responses from all 32 local authorities. So I think it's a fairly good picture. And it's from um, the homelessness prevention and housing options teams. Um, there's a report on our website, I believe, and if it isn't, it'll be there by the end of today. Um, but to summarise, and they were saying less than a quarter of the homelessness services were saying that they required any additional demand on services in order to fulfil the duty. Um, a similar number were putting in additional resources, but they might have been doing that anyway. And housing options and has been sort of credited with refocusing the work so that the housing support duty complements it very well. Um, the biggest issue that has been picked up um, has been to do with non-engagement. And so where people have had initial assessment and have been found to require support and then they haven't engaged with um, the support services provided. Um, there isn't a great deal more that we've said about other than people generally feel that um, the housing support duty is a good thing. The guidance came after it was in place, and so a lot of processes were already in existence, and so it was a bit cart before the horse, uh, and people are having to wait. A, you can't move a big ship 
really quickly to turn around and so they're having to look at when is a convenient review point in order to tally up with what their practice is and what their guidance is. Generally it's been welcomed but it, it hasn't had the big scary impact that people perhaps have been afraid of. But it has flagged up issues to do with non-engagement and communicating the importance of support to people who are liable to need it. Uh, Emma? Just briefly, I'd like to pick up on that last point from Nick, that our services, uh, particularly the Safe and Sound Service, have felt that maybe some of the non-engagement comes from how the support would be offered, particularly to young people, that uh, in some circumstances the young person might have just been shown a tick list with a whole list of different support needs. Are any of these you? you? Ten <laughs> seconds, no. Or, yes, I have a problem with maybe so-and-so, and, the, and then a leaflet is given or a phone number. And it, uh, particularly where these issues are, you know, they're difficult issues, maybe long-term issues, and that's why the housing support duty is in place, because these are the issues that are going to prevent somebody potentially from being able to maintain a home. That communication around what can we do to, to surround you with the help to, uh, to deal with deal with this needs to be tackled in a very informed and appropriate way, particularly for, for young people. Yeah, cool. Moving on then, one of the, the areas that we've heard evidence on is about the intentionality criterion. Do you think that there are people, young people, being defined as intentionally homeless that really shouldn't be, and if so, what should be done? Volunteer? Alice, would you like to answer? <laughs> <laughs> you said that just as Emma was volunteering oh, to speak. Emma, <laughs> we'll go to Emma then. Yep. If you look at the percentage increase of intentionality that's been seen across the board of the homelessness population, uh, the, the youth homelessness intentionality has decisions have risen from 3% a couple of years ago to 5% last year, which is still a small percentage, but in terms of 3 to 5, that, that's a significant p percentage change. Um, but it reflects the general population change across the whole homelessness population. I think particularly with young people, uh, we need to recognise that the, their journeys into homelessness are often very complex and very messy and it's not necessarily just a one instance. Uh, we had a terrible argument and my parents kicked me out and I can't go back and I can get them to write a letter to state that. You know, it's very difficult in and out and sometimes staying with one person, sometimes staying in a car. And that is difficult to demonstrate, um, and particularly where the relationship is entirely broken down and the parents don't necessarily want to engage with the local authority for whatever historical reasons, getting the evidence of what happens that some local authorities can require is very d difficult to do and supporting a young person's story and evidence. Um, but you know, there, there, are, there is some good practice of local authorities out there. There are professionals in the field who do really understand that and are willing to take somebody's word or just the evidence of the situation for it. Can I from a slightly different angle? Are there, is there any evidence of young people maintaining tenancies or housing arrangements that are perhaps unsafe or suboptimal because they would be worried about being considered to be intentionally homeless if they left them. Anybody got any experience of that? I don't have any experience of it, but that doesn't mean to say that it may not be the case. I'd actually say yes. There are um, recently undertook the Youth Homelessness in Scotland Survey 2014, and one of the situations that, again, it's an awareness thing. Young people who um, are currently, for example, sofa surfing or staying with family and friends who do not present as homeless because they don't know they're homeless, eventually will present to a service. Often the situations that have led them to that thing have been things such as um, sanctions, whether they're inappropriately applied or not. Um, and we've got evidence of, of that where that's where there's a huge increase um, 
and there have been decisions from certain job centres within certain local authorities that I could name, but I'm not going to, because we don't shame anyone. Oh, the temptation. Um, who have um, inappropriately applied sanctions that have had knock-on effects. So you know, they have taken away housing benefit when they shouldn't, or they've delayed payments while decisions have been going through when they shouldn't. And that has put young people at risk. And because they've been seen not to engage with Job Centre Plus, then they've been deemed to be, um, yeah. Moving on now to John Finney. I'd like to direct a question to Alice, if I may, please. Uh, Alice, in crisis um, evidence, uh, you say in a quote here, crisis believes that the extension of the shared accommodation rate alongside long-standing problems with benefits for younger adults will put people in Scotland at particular risk of homelessness. Now, can I ask what the impact of the shared accommodation rate and the introduction of direct payments has had on the ability of young people to find and maintain a tenancy, please. And given the time constraints, if you also want to throw in some comments about bedroom tax, that would be welcome. Thank you. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, certainly we have really grave concerns about the impact of, of the shared accommodation rate, um, not only on under 25s, but also on under 35, since it was extended in 2012 to 25 to 34 year olds for the first time. Um, what we have seen from research we've conducted and we mentioned that in the written submission so I won't go into too much detail about that was that there's real problems with both affordability and availability of um, of shared accommodation um, and this echoes the conversations that we've been having with housing advisors around the country again a local authority that I won't name said that they didn't see a single room advertised within the local one um, the local shared accommodation rate within 18 months um, and um, and like I I think that would be critical for the local authority. If there is a challenge, are you able to see what that area is? That would be... uh, it's anecdotal, so I, th I think I'd, right, I'd, okay. I'd rather not, if that's okay. Um, but certainly, um, as I say, yeah, we, so we, there, are, there are grave issues with, with affordability and, and availability for those who are limited to the shared accommodation rate. And at the same time, we know that the social housing sector is declining in Scotland, and so this is um, going to be putting far more, more pressure and... Um, uh, on, uh, on young people to, to, find, uh, to find realistic accommodation. Um, what we know from research that the DWP commissioned is that overall across Great Britain, the caseload of under 35s on local housing allowance, so on housing benefit in the private sector, has dramatically fallen since these, um, since these changes were made. So from the period just prior to the reforms being introduced to August 2013 saw a 13% drop in 25 to 34 year olds and a 9% drop in under 25 year olds in receipt of local housing allowance. Now obviously what that data doesn't tell us is what happened to those individuals. Some of them may, move, may have moved back in with their parents if that was an option, some of them may have moved into work and may uh, may now be on an income that means they're no longer eligible for, for housing benefit but our concern is that many of them may actually be homeless or hidden homeless um, and certainly a number of landlords uh, interviewed as part of that research including a number of large landlords in, in areas of Scotland said that their analysis was, their worry was that these individuals were sleeping on friend sofas um, uh, and like I said, we really don't know where they've gone, but that is a that is a real a real concern um, when the uh, when the amount of housing benefit available is simply not enough to meet the cost of even a room in a cheap shared house, and that's coupled with the the problems I identified earlier about local authority staff simply not being aware of what um, accommodation is available in the private rented sector. Um, you asked me to mention the bedroom tax, so I will. Um, uh, and I think one of the, the issues is that we're seeing local authority staff are, um, for the most part, unaware or have a lack of understanding of what might be available in the private rented sector. But at the same time, they're not able to find one-bed properties for uh, in, in the social sector because then young people, of course, would be subject to the bedroom tax. And understandably, they're not going to be letting rooms that are going to be unaffordable to, to those young people. Um, so it really leaves uh, young people with very, very limited options, if, if any. And what we're seeing, in particularly in the 25 to 34-year age group, is that they're 
they're uh, too old to be um, eligible for any youth homelessness services. So there's a real gap for, for that group. And that's why we're working with, um, with Scottish Government funding. I'm glad to say we are working with every, uh, with all 32 local authorities to try and um, identify ways of, um, of supporting young people into shared accommodation in the private rented sector. Because a lot of those housing advisors recognise that with the impact of, of welfare reform and the declining social sector, the private rented sector is going to have to play, to play a bigger role. Um, and I guess the, the final thing I'd say is that for quite a long time now we've been uh, pressing the UK government to at the very least review the shared accommodation rate and if the Scottish Parliament does get greater powers in this area then I think that would be a really meaningful and valuable opportunity to really think about how best young people who need support with their housing costs can be supported. Thank you for that uh, comprehensive reply. Just one very yes, brief yeah. supplementary. Of course, there would be a challenge for identifying the housing component where universal credit is, and that's been trialled in my own area in Inverness. Yeah. Yes, um, and uh, I, I think, I mean, in terms of universal credit, I think one of the... Uh, one of the elements of universal credit that we're concerned about, we don't have any, um, any real concerns about the principle of it in terms of, you know, if the benefit system can be simplified, fantastic. Um, the question of direct payments does pose a concern because we have seen um, rent arrears increasing in areas where it's, where, it's, um, where it's been introduced and also in pilot areas where direct payments have been trialled by particular housing associations. Um, one of the other things that the um, DWP commissioned research into the changes to local housing allowance revealed was that in those cases where landlords have been willing to uh, to negotiate the rent slightly because of people's um, uh, le lesser entitlement to housing benefit, then often that has been in exchange for them receiving the housing benefit directly rather than it being paid to the tenant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, Marco. Um, I'm <coughs> just wondering, Deneen Canmore was one of the pilot yeah. groups for the direct payments. Do you have anything to add based on the experience? There? Well, uh, our experience with that is that, that, that there, are, there are issues around um, the danger of, of, of people falling into debt, but also for housing associations, the loss of rent revenue is an issue there. Our, our pilot experience of that is that, that some of, some of the, the, the consequences can be mitigated, but it's hugely resourceful. Uh, we had to put in a huge amount of staff resourcing into that exercise, which was funded through WB uh, and DWB. Um, and the concern would be where that's not there, um, that's going to leave uh, uh, housing organisations and, and, and councils um, with a situation where uh, it's very, very resource intensified and it's very difficult to maintain that. And of course, a big issue there is that people may become uh, evicted may end up becoming evicted um, through that. And we then get into the cycle again. And I think that's the thing we've really got to keep an eye on, um, the danger of, in fact, creating homelessness through uh, a, a, an attempt to try to simplify uh, a, a, a welfare benefit system. Thank you. Siobhan, would you like you. to ask a question? Yeah, just for Mr. Schutt, you said earlier on when we were talking about um, housing benefit and the impact that would have on a young person who's in a college place, for instance, um, and obviously if there are more powers coming to Scotland, you would like to see um, us doing something in that regard. I was just looking for more information in regards to that. I mean, we share um, that sentiment, but if others share that sentiment, because obviously there's... The, there's the more people that speak about it, um, the better for us to make that case. But secondly, have you seen an increase in that happening? Are the numbers staying the same? Do you know what's happening out there since our last report? Emma. Yeah. Um, one of the young people who accessed the Safe and Sound service recently said, it's like I have to choose between college and a roof over my head. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's not fair to, to be happening in Scotland. Um, and so I very much w would highlight uh, and support Bob's comments that if there was an opportunity to ask questions about whether there is a way to do th that with housing benefit, that, that we could f find a better solution for these young vulnerable people to continue to engage in training or education, which lots of research has shown is one of the routes out of homelessness. Um, I was just saying, there, there is a mechanism that could be used, which is discretionary housing payments, 
But I think there is a real fear and even a lack of understanding from local authorities about using them. Um, I've, um, through work with one local authority, the, the clarity about when um, an application to DHP could be made and sustained and a repeat of that, it, was just, it wasn't clear within how they were working. Um, that problem is lying. Is it information from government down yes. to local authority? Or yes, local it's government down to local authority because of the, particularly due to the changes that were made to DHP. Uh -huh. um, I, I think people are scared of it being a pot of money that runs out, but that has led to it being underspent. Mm -hmm. That the extension of DHP now to um, a maximum of twelve months, people seem to think it's a one-off rather than it can be repeated. So if you're doing a three-year college course, there's no reason why you can't be supported for three years. But there's that fear. And I think that also... Um, sometimes there is... I, th I think there is... A, oh, I'm loath to use the word prejudice, but there is that suspicion that young people might not maintain their tenancy anyway, even though there's nothing to indicate that they won't. And so, oh, we can't give them DHP because... And you come up with a, a circuitous route... To, to kind of fulfil your own prejudices. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Can I go back to temporary accommodation very briefly? Um, there were specific concerns about the increased use of temporary accommodation and the evidence was actually raised in our committee and also the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee during their follow-up work on the homelessness commitment. Um, could you give us a comment on the standard of temporary accommodation and could you actually comment whether the standard has actually increased or it's fallen? Emma. Um, Shelter Scotland have long been campaigning for uh, the Scottish Government to produce uh, officially endorsed guidance on a minimum standard for temporary accommodation. Um, which would include specific guidance for temporary accommodation for young people. Um, for what's appropriate for young people in, in terms of temporary accommodation. Uh, as my colleagues have picked up, there's a lack of appropriate one-bed uh, accommodation within social housing stock in general, which then reflects on temporary accommodation. Uh, uh, so, so there needs to be a really a reconsidering of the, the stock that's there for, for temporary accommodation to meet the changing demographic demographic need of demand following the 2012 commitment. So I believe that local authorities should review and revise the temporary accommodation stock that they have, both in terms of size and shape and ge geographical position, as well as um, the conditions. Um, people are staying in for longer in temporary accommodation as well, which only highlights the need for uh, a look at the conditions that they're in. Um, Due to the lack of appropriate temporary accommodation and supported accommodation for young people, our teams have seen young people, uh, for example, with mental health difficulties, being offered places in completely inappropriate adult hostels, uh, which are dangerous and risky, but also which young people just can't navigate. They're treated as adults in forms and so on, but which they don't have skills and resources to, to respond appropriately to. Uh, and in that situation, we find that many, many young people would rather sofa surf put themselves in unstable, unsuitable, again, potentially risky situations than engage with what's being offered to them because the lack of quality and lack of availability. Christian, very briefly, we're running out of yeah. time. I yeah. just wanted to have a supplementary on this. Uh, a question uh, to the Scottish Government from John Finney, uh, my colleague John Finney, and Margaret Burgess, uh, the Minister of Housing, came back and gave us a breakdown by, by local authorities. And I was astonished to see that even if there is a decrease uh, uh, across Scotland, uh, there are some areas who are very, very high, and one of the areas being Aberdeenshire, an, an area I, I represent, regarding the use on bed and breakfast. <laughs> Uh, why is this so patchy? Why, why is it used a lot more in areas than others, uh, if you think? And as well, is that a sensible uh, uh, option, housing option for the future, bed and breakfast? I think first and foremost, I would say that I don't think bed and breakfast is a sensible housing option, particularly for young people. 
uh, some very, very, very vulnerable people being put in bed and breakfast situations which are completely detrimental to their mental and phys physical health. Um, as for the uh, variation across Scotland, I mean, we've mentioned it previously in terms of housing options. Uh, there's such wide differences in housing stock, in the availability of resources, in how councils choose to uh, apply their resources for temporary accommodation. Some local authorities haven't prioritised uh, providing the right temporary accommodation. Uh, for the people that need it in their areas. I mean, obviously, in rural communities, you have issues around uh, the proximity of temporary accommodation to somebody's home or to the centre. Um, so I, I think this is one area where you really have to consider local authorities on a case-by-case -case basis. But I think where local authorities are showing that they're consistently overusing bed and breakfast, there needs to be challenging questions raised for them. Thank you. Um, a very brief question from John Mason, and can I ask for an even probably briefer answer, please, because we're running okay, close to time. Okay, this is based on the Homeless Action Scotland paper, uh, which is something I don't think we've touched on, which was that uh, those leaving kinship care or looked after at home are a particularly vulnerable group. Is that, is that the case? Um, yes, and continuing care should should help pick that up in that the rights have been extended to them. But at the moment, young people who are in kinship care or continue, uh, um, yeah, looked after at home, uh, thank you, um, they, because they, they tend not to have the same access to support when they're at home or um, when they're looked after by family members. And so they have even less support when they leave home. Um, and, and actually, it's one of the situations where, where mediation would work very well. Um, but often the opportunity is missed. Thank you very much for that. That actually concludes today's meeting. I can thank our witnesses for coming along and giving us that information. It's been really useful. Our next meeting will take place on Thursday, the 9th of October. Thank you.